It's the 5th of February 2013 and former state MP Eddie Obeid is sitting face to face with ICAC's prosecutor, Jeffrey Watson. Obeid is on charges of misusing his influence in the Labor Party to secure a license for his family farm. Watson grills Obeid on how he had so much wealth on just a politician's salary, and at this, Obeid bites. Oh, Mr. Watson. No, don't Watson me. Well, don't come and say I'm squirreling away anything. I've spent more money than you've made in a lifetime. So to all those who've called me a Labor hack, I'll give you this one. Today we're going to look at perhaps the darkest chapter in Labor's history. And we're going to begin the story in 2008 with the resignation of its Premier, Morrissey Yama. So Labor had been in power all the way since 1995, and for 10 of those years they were led by Bob Carr before he resigned and Yama took over. However, just two years into his premiership, Yemen defied the Labor Party state conference and started privatising New South Wales' electricity. This burned his support within the party and after the Labor caucus rejected his cabinet reshuffle in 2008, Yemen had no other decision but to resign. And so this is where we're going to introduce two key faction bosses from the New South Wales right faction. The first was our mate that we referenced before, Eddie Obeid. But the second was his protege and the man he discipled for over a decade, Joe Tripodi. They were known as absolute kingmakers and they would prove that it was impossible to rise to leadership without their support. Also, Joe Tripodi nearly punched on in parliament with the member for Coffs Harbour. But though Tripodi and Obeid were kingmakers, they had one major issue. Iyema was the only really suitable candidate from New South Wales right, and with him now gone, they'd have to support someone from Labor left to have any chance of keeping their jobs after the 2011 election. Tripodi and Obeid settled on supporting this guy, Nathan Rees, who had only been in Parliament for 19 months. Though this was a remarkable rise to power, Rees was held at gunpoint. Should he refuse to kiss the ring, he'd lose his job. Now, history hasn't been kind to Rees as he's remembered as one of the shortest serving premiers and as someone completely ineffective in solving the huge internal issues that existed within the party. I'm going to vouch for him here. Obeid was such a huge juggernaut who no individual could take down. Yeah, Rees himself went down, but he went down swinging. Essentially, Rees wanted to make it clear that moral debauchery had no place in his government and took a strong stance against anything that'd bring further scandal to the Labor brand. A lot of my subscribers, myself included, might be too young to remember the scandal of Milton Okopoulos. Look him up in your own time. It's bad. And Reza actually went ahead and fired three people from cabinet for indecent behaviour. The first was his police minister Matt Brown, who stripped down to his underpants and danced around a leather couch during a drunken party in Parliament House. Now, this mightn't sound like much, and compared to the others, it really wasn't, but you've got to understand just how damaged the Labour brand was by this sort of thing as the public perception was that they had absolutely no moral backbone. The next on the chopping block was Tony Stewart, the Minister for Small Business, after there were allegations he'd verbally and physically harassed a staff member. Rather than wait for legal proceedings, Rees ordered his own external investigation, with the report concluding that the allegations were indeed correct. Rees fired Stewart from Cabinet, and then Stewart actually then took him to court for unfair dismissal, but the courts ruled that cabinet was entirely at the discretion of the party and not the same thing as being fired as say a tradie. Finally, Rees pressured John Della Bosca to resign from cabinet after he'd had a six month affair. Della Bosca's wife was also a Labor MP representing the electorate of Robertson, so not only was it a sex scandal, but it was also mistreatment against another Labor party member. Rees didn't just stop there though. Eager to clean up Labor, he set up a parliamentary committee to address corruption. The committee recommended all sorts of reforms on corruption laws and Rees himself even banned donations from property developers to the Labor Party. But there were people who were known for opposing Rees on his crusade against corruption. Most notably, Primary Industries leader Ian MacDonald and Finance Minister Joe Tripodi. Where's Eddie Obeid in all of this? Well, he actually hadn't held a cabinet position since 2003. Why would you need to have a ministry when you've got Tripodi already in there? But that was the exact issue. For Rees, he didn't want to kiss the ring and he wanted Tripodi gone. So for New South Wales Labor, it was convention for the Labor caucus, that's all elected members in both houses, to select who would be in the cabinet. From that selection, the Premier would then assign portfolios. Well, at the end of 2009, Nathan Rees applied for extraordinary powers to appoint his own cabinet. 
and the New South Wales Labor State Conference agreed to give it to him. The next day, Reece sacked Tripodi and McDonald, well aware that this would likely mean the end of his premiership, as the Tripodi obeyed faction sought to take revenge. Now, this was Tripodi's response to the whole saga. Um, I was actually the last line of resistance and last line of support for Nathan. Uh, as all the journalists know, I was a strong defender of his premiership. Uh, once he decided to, uh, to remove me, um, all I did was take a step back, and it was only a matter of time. Uh, and these so, aren't tactical fibs you're telling us, because no. others, others would have done it. You're, you're really saying I, that... Uh, I, was, I was the only one that was stopping them from doing it. What Tripodi doesn't say in this interview was that the next month he signed a petition to organise the New South Wales Labor caucus to have a leadership spill. As Rees gave a press conference before the spill, he said, I will not hand over New South Wales to Eddie O'Bead or Joe Tripodi. And that if someone were to replace him by the end of the day, they will be a puppet of Joe Tripodi and Eddie Obeid. The candidate that was put forward by the Obeid Tripodi faction was Christina Keneally. She defeated Rees 47 to 21. Now, Keneally became the first female Premier of New South Wales. Probably not in the way that gets a nice history textbook chapter, but she was there. And Keneally's maiden speech as Premier was basically her trying to defend the fact that she wasn't anyone's puppet. Crucially, Rees declined to serve in her cabinet, but actually said a lot of positive stuff about Keneally afterwards, perhaps because his seat was on the line in 2011. But still, he said stuff like this. I think she's, doing, I think she's doing a very good job in difficult withdraw? circumstances. Now, with Keneally leading Labor into the 2011 election, it was clear that Barry O'Farrell was going to win. That was never in doubt. However, some predictions had Labor winning just 15 seats, and they only ended up taking 20 out of the 93 available ones. Out of interest, who would you have preferenced in the 2011 election? Labor or Liberal? Obviously, the defeat was primarily down to the fact that people had grown tired of the leadership merry-go-round and constant scandals. What people don't often mention was that there was an internal war launched by Joe Tripodi himself. So essentially, in a separate ICAC matter regarding Tripodi in 2014, one of the junior councillors involved in the investigation, Greg O'Mahony, told someone you might know, the future Labor leader Jody McKay, that they had pretty good information that mining magnate Nathan Tinkler, Ann Wills, and Joe Tripodi himself paid $50,000 to an anonymous leaflet distributor. This distributor then ran leaflets criticising McKay and her electorate of Newcastle. McKay then told ICAC that Tinkler had offered to bankroll a campaign in exchange for approving his $1 billion coal project. She was actually in tears at ICAC as she told them that Tripodi wanted to control her through Tinkler. But the corruption allegations didn't end there for Tripodi because next he was on the chopping block for his involvement in aiding his mentor, Eddie O'Bead, in even deeper corruption. So, this place right here, Circular Key, is absolute prime commercial real estate. And it turns out that Eddie O'Bead's family owned Arc, Sorrentino and Key Eatery, which were cafes in the area. However, their ownership was actually hidden through a secret trust. A handful of people in the government, including Joe Tripodi, knew about this. And Obeid lobbied the deputy head of New South Wales Maritime to renew the leases of these cafes without those leases going on the market once again upon expiry. Obeid kept his stake in the cafes a secret and Tripodi was dead silent as all of this was going on. Though Labor immediately terminated Tripodi's party membership, ICAC recommended that no charges be laid against Tripodi for his role in these two corruption scandals. The same cannot be said for Eddie Obeid. Actually, before we get there, ICAC launched a second wave of investigations into Tripodi in 2016 and found more damning conduct. The finding alleged Tripodi of leaking information to Nathan Tinkler to benefit Bildev, and that Tripodi also pushed Labor to give a lucrative contract to Australian Water Holdings of which the Obeid family owned a significant stake. On this one, they recommended criminal charges of misconduct in public office, and those criminal charges came in 2022. But to go back to Obeid, those criminal charges came well before last year. So back in 2007, Obeid bought this property in the Bailong Valley near Mudgee. Obeid's son, Moses, negotiated into Cascade Coal, while at the same time, Eddie Obeid lobbied Ian McDonald to grant a mining license into the valley and therefore over his land. It's alleged that the Obeid family gained $30 million from this deal. So in 2013, ICAC launched its investigation into this deal and at the same time probed inquiries into the debacle with Circular Key and Australian Water Holdings. Oh, and there was also another one on top of that. 
Essentially, he'd lobbied the government to give favorable treatment to a telehealth provider without disclosing that his family had an interest in that company. Obeid's defense was the usual song and dance, ICAC's a sham, it's a witch hunt trying to take a good man down, you get the picture. And his hearings were fiery affairs with him boasting of his much greater wealth than the ICAC lawyers. A great look when you're on trial for corruption, right? The ICAC hearings also heard testimony from Iyema and Reese. Reese was asked if he felt vindicated after earlier taking a stand against Tripodi and Obeid, to which he said no, but instead sadness at the state of the Labor Party. He also called Australian water holdings a bunch of crooks. After ICAC referred both Obeid and McDonald to the DPP, Obeid was considered a flight risk because Australia has no extradition treaty with Lebanon and was ordered to surrender his passport. After a three week trial, man, I would have loved to have been on jury duty that week, the jury found Obeid guilty of misconduct in public office and he was sentenced to five years in Silverwater jail. Obeid appealed the conviction on the basis of parliamentary sovereignty i.e. he should have been dealt with parliament rather than the courts. This failed and he remained in jail until gaining parole in 2019. But it didn't end there for Obeid. In 2021, he was charged with criminal conspiracy for his role in gaining the Bailong Valley mining license. Along with McDonald, Obeid was found guilty and sentenced to seven years prison, though was immediately released on bail for fear of contracting COVID before finally moving to Cooma prison alongside Roger Rogerson and Jared Hain of all people. Alongside Tripodi, Obeid was hit with another charge of public office misconduct in 2022 for his role in the Australian water holding scandal. So obviously, this was such a damning indictment on the New South Wales right faction of the Labor Party that corruption could be so widespread. And Labor got what they deserved as they spent 12 years in the wilderness, even though the Liberal Party were far from above board themselves. But as we rightfully remember the woes of Obeid and Tripodi, it's only fair that we remember Nathan Rees. When Labor was at its darkest hour, Reeves was faced with two decisions. One, kiss the ring and keep his position. Or two, fight the Tripodi faction, lose the top job, possibly his seat too, and watch his party crash and burn. Reeves chose the latter and it proved to be the decision that saved New South Wales Labor. Sure, Tripodi had his candidate in with Christina Keneally, but Labor's position was now so weak that heaps of his allies were about to be voted out. And yes, Labor struggled in opposition for a decade, but the faction that had integrity won. Though I think it's fair to say that Jody McKay wasn't as effective a campaigner as Chris Minns proved to be, it was quite the statement that for two years, Labor was led by the woman who refused to be bought off and paid for it with her seat, while her executioner currently faces criminal charges. Make no mistake, Eddie O'Bead brought Labor to the brink of being a party that was beyond redemption. But Rees waged the war that ended up taking his faction down. He might be remembered as the only Labor Premier not to ever take them to an election, but that wasn't without reason. And it's about time he gets the credit he deserves. We've discussed ICAC a lot today. What you might not know is that it has a pretty wild history, including it taking down the very Premier who insisted it be instituted. Click here to learn all about the incredible backfire of Nick Griner introducing ICAC to take down his political enemies.